Our next speaker is Chuck Rayzon. I think many of you know. Chuck was the clinical director of the Mind Body Program at Emory, and more recently is an associate professor at the McClelland Institute at the University of Arizona. And he has had a long-term interest in uh, the effect of uh, actually depression on the immune system, as well as how mental training can have an impact on that and potentially what that uh, implies to other systems. Uh, Chuck, are you hiding somewhere? Oh, I just... It's a great honor to be here. I don't need to tell anybody here the stress is a profound risk factor for all sorts of illnesses. It's, uh, it is probably the royal road into mental disturbances, but it's also a very powerful risk factor for physical disease, especially metabolic and cardiovascular disorders. And people have been interested in years trying to understand, well, how does that happen? What are the mechanisms in the brain and the body that, that make stress so toxic? And when we think about stress, we typically think about the systems that Dr. Poor just talked about, the autonomic nervous system, and something called the HPA axis. What's become more clear recently is that stress also powerfully activates the immune system. And uh, a number of us, Ferdos Debar has written eloquently about this, uh, suspect that the reason that stress activates inflammatory pathways is because across evolutionary time, stress was probably a, real, a fairly reliable indicator that you were about to undergo tissue damage. And I now understand from Dan's talk that, in fact, I used to always say, well, you know, that it's a mismatch, doesn't happen anymore, but 6,000 people being bitten a year in the workplace, it's clear that it may still have some adaptive advantages. Stress, your, your, your boss about to bite your ass, and uh, you want to get your inflammatory cytokines running ahead of time so that you can decrease the risk of infection. Uh, but of course, we also know that inflammation in response to stress is increasingly looking like it's one of the main pathways whereby stress is transduced into sickness, both emotional and physical. We've spent many years studying this using this setup, which is called the Trier Social Stress Test. And just real briefly, for those of you who don't know about it, you, you, you get a, a subject here. He knows he's in for some sort of stress test. He doesn't really understand what it is. But he's sitting in a room. People come in. They put IVs in his arm, at least the way we do it, start drawing blood, hook up to measure his heart rate, start getting saliva for cortisol, put him in a wheelchair, wheel him into a room. The door flies open. He sees three people frowning at him in white coats. He's told to stand up. We've, we've interviewed him already. We know what he wants to do in his life. He wants to go to medical school. So he's told that, he, that he, he needs to consider this to be a mock job interview for medical school, that this is a panel of behavioral experts trained to analyze his behavior, but to try to ignore that, and that he will be videotaped for later behavioral analysis, but to try not to pay any attention to that, uh, and that he'll be given five minutes to, to uh, prepare notes, but he won't be able to use them. So. Then the panel leaves, he takes his notes, we draw blood, panel comes back, only the guy in the middle, it's always a guy, uh, speaks, the chairman, and he says, we train these people never to smile, never to nod, to make no eye contact, or other than kind of glaring. And the poor guy starts talking. If he, uh, if he falls silent, the, the guy in the center's got 20 seconds, he just stares at him. Please continue, you have more time. If the guy is glib, the chairman will usually say something like, are you always this glib for important interviews? Something like that. Uh, at the end of five minutes, Chairman says, stop, we have another task. We want you to take the number 1,087 and subtract by 13s down to zero as rapidly and accurately as possible. Please start. First mistake, stop, 1,087. Stop, don't use your fingers, 1,087. So at the end of about 10, 15 minutes of this total thing, heart rate's up, blood pressure's up. We've had some older codger guys try to attack the dude here. We've had people pass out. <laughs> it's a big stressor. Not surprisingly, therefore, as I'll show you, it activates inflammation. You're going to see this chart several times, so let me explain it. On the, uh, on the x-axis is time. Here's the time before the stressor. Here's the time of that interview and math test. Here's 90 minutes afterwards. We're just going to look at the blood concentrations of a classic inflammatory molecule called interleukin-6, or IL-6. This is a study by my colleague Tad Pace and Andy Miller took a group of medically healthy men who were not depressed, and if you give them this task, and this has been shown many times, they almost double their interleukin-6 levels. And in fact, day in, day out, this sort of difference actually has fairly significant health consequences in terms of increasing your risk for vascular disease and diabetes, cancer, and dementia. But if you take a group of men who are the same age, also medically healthy, but that, have, that underwent early life trauma and are depressed, you see a remarkable 
augmentation of inflammation. It's almost as if their brain and body thinks they're under some sort of massive bacterial assault. Uh, and whether this is adaptive in a long evolutionary scheme of things, there's lots of evidence to suggest it's problematic in our world. This is a study I really find fascinating. It came out fairly recently. They gave people TSSTs, and they assessed whether people got more or less self-reported emotionally positive, like, I'm really doing this pretty well, or negative, like, oh, I'm such a loser. And they measured another cytokine, in this case, interleukin-1, which is another classic inflammatory mediator, and found that the people that began to feel positive uh, had a flat line of the inflammation, whereas the people that began to feel like they were losers had this skyrocketing IL-1. Now, what's remarkable is that this loss of positive outlook during this simple laboratory task really robustly predicted how much depressive symptoms were going to increase in that person's life over the next year, an effect that was almost entirely uh, mediated by the increase in the inflammatory cytokines. So it's very clear that if you are somebody who, because perhaps of early life adversity especially, has been physiologically sensitized to perceive social threats and dangers as being immunological stimuli, that this causes the production of chemicals that we know go to the brain and promote depression and many other illnesses. So the obvious uh, one obvious thing to do about this is to say, well, heck, man, maybe if we could figure out some way to help people reappraise psychosocial stressors, uh, we could show that it turned down inflammatory responses to stress, and it seems fairly self-evident that that would be beneficial in terms of health. So the reason I put this picture up is because my longtime colleague, Geshe Lobsang, Tenzin Nagy, and I said, all right, well, we're interested in studying meditation. What should we do? This is now probably six, seven years ago. And we both agreed that compassion meditation, especially Lojong-based training, such as, as Jinpa outlined uh, this morning, might be especially interesting because there are such radical attempts to reconceptualize one's personal surround from being a place of threat and danger to being a place of opportunity uh, and, and, and sort of bon ami. And so Geshe Lobsang took upon himself to try to boil down this Lojong tradition into uh, in initially a six-week, now we tend to do it in eight weeks, uh, training uh, system. I'm not going to belabor this because it, it, it lines up very much with what uh, other people were talking with the CFT and the CCT. Well, we had to pick a different uh, consonant, so we got a B here, cognitively based compassion training. We call it CBCT. You know, it's a, we, we got we to make all these things sound really uh, official. Um, but at any rate, it, it follows the same two steps that Jinpa outlined. First is equanimity, which, uh, you know, is, you can explain it different ways, but I, one way I like to think about it is just that you try to, you know, the, the people that you're too attached to, you try to equalize that. The people that you have aversion towards, you try to lessen that. And you try to quit ignoring all the people that you don't perceive as being of direct value to you. And then, when, which is really an attempt to see the world as it is. And there's a lot of evidence that that's the case. And then in the CBCT model, once you've done that, you then begin practicing trying at first, uh, actually, uh, somewhat artificially, to make yourself feel a deep empathy, this endearment that Jinpa talked about, uh, for everyone. Uh, and in, in this protocol, uh, unlike what they're doing at Stanford, which is really an interesting idea we were talking about this morning, we start with the self and then go to the, the person you care about naturally, then to the stranger, and then to the, the adversary or the difficult person. So again, very much uh, again like what, what, what Helen was talking about. So we published a study a number of years ago where we took undergraduates, and this is the slide that Richie was showing when his voice was cracking up. So it's kind of cool that I, I don't, uh, this, I would have been showing some of you already heard about had you really been able to hear him. But we, <laughs> that's making lemonade out of lemons, isn't it? Um, we took a group of, of, of about 65, 70 uh, freshman students. They were very bad meditators in general. Randomized them either to a health discussion control group or six weeks of CBCT, and then gave them this TRIER social stress test. At the end of that time, we found no difference at all between the groups. So there was no effect of randomization. Within the compassion group, there were people that were practicing eight times a week, and there were people who were practicing two times in six weeks, right? I mean, it, we had this huge range. And so we had two hypotheses. One was that there'd be a, a group effect. The other is that there'd be a practice time effect. We didn't see the group effect, but we saw a very strong practice time effect. The more often these kids practice per week, the lower their IL-6 responses were to the uh, TSST stressor, the less 
self-reported distress they felt. I don't have it here, but their heart rate was also lower. So there was this indication that they had both reduced physiologic responses and emotional responses. But the problem, of course, was we only, at that point, we didn't have a, a methodology for giving this, this TSST twice, right? It's like the, you know, that old saying, fool me once, uh, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? And there's evidence that people, they, they attenuate. They go, oh, <laughs> I've seen you before, right? We had to devise sort of uh, sneaky ways to get around that, which we've subsequently done. But because we only did it at the end, it raises the possibility that maybe people that just don't have big inflammatory or emotional responses to stress are more able to practice, right? That's not such a far-fetched idea. Meditation is not so easy, right? So maybe, maybe it's actually reversed causality. And we haven't absolutely disproven that yet, but I want to show you what we've done thus far. We have a big study now going on called the CALM study, which will settle that issue. But we've kind of gotten halfway to suggesting that the arrow of causality is the direction you'd like to see, which is, so we, we did a first study, and I've showed you that. We randomized people to either compassion meditation, CBCT, or the health discussion group. They got the interventions, then they got the stress test. And I'm, the way I'm going to show you the data, because it looks better this way, is we're going to take practice time. We're going to divide people up into a high practice group and a low practice group just by a median split, all right? Then subsequently, because we had to prove we could do the TSST twice, uh, we did exactly the opposite. We took another freshman cohort that f remarkably were perfectly matched on everything from BMI to, to age, of course. We did a TSST first to see if these responses would then predict whether they would land in a high or low practice time group. Also, fortunately, the practice times were almost exactly identical in these two cohorts. So, what we found uh, is in this uh, graph, here's the people that got the TSSTs prior to the meditation. Here's the people that got the, TS, the stress test after the meditation. And what you can see, if we start with the interleukin-6, so this is the inflammatory response in the blood. Whether you, whether you had a high or a low IL-6 response made no difference. Your IL-6 response did not predict whether you'd end up either in a high or low practice group. But on the other hand, if you got the training and then you got the TSST, people that practiced a lot had remarkable reductions in IL-6. They came in the door with less IL-6, although we now know that, that we're drawing, that coming in the door to the TSST, people are already stressed out. So, but a, a very striking difference. So it suggests that the arrow of causality runs from training to reduced IL-6 in response to stress. Cortisol, cortisol responses to a stressor before learning meditation, before learning compassion meditation, have no predictive value, right? So it doesn't matter whether you have a big cortisol response or a low cortisol response in terms of whether you're gonna subsequently practice. On the other hand, and I think this is kind of neat, the people that got the training and then got the stress test, the people that practiced went up really, this is not statistically different, so they went up as high as the low practice guys, but they recovered much, much more rapidly, which is sort of, I think this is what we'd like to see physiologically from first principles. You, you, there's a lot of evidence that people that have sluggish cortisol responses, that actually is often associated with psychiatric disturbances and often some medical conditions too. But the ability to mount the response, but then not chew on it, you know, not to, but to have it resolve once the stressor's finished, I, I find that I, that's a very promising little piece of data, I think. And then finally, if you look at behavior, you see the same pattern. So whether you thought that stress test was miserable or not, had no... Uh, that didn't predict at all in this cohort whether they went on to practice or not. But the people who practiced a lot, uh, who then got a stressor, had much lower behavioral distress. It was just lower all the way through. They weren't as, they weren't as bug coming in the door, and they just stayed low. So taken together, these two studies, both of which have now been published, suggest the sort of promising arrow of causality. Like I said, we're now doing a big study where we're doing TSSTs before and after the interventions. Um, of course, that's interesting, but it really, and I'm not going to be able to answer how, but it, you know, you start thinking, okay, well, how? And there's all sorts of hows. What is it how meditation? Is it learning mindfulness? Is that the how? Is it specific to the compassion? Is it just general that, you know, that you're getting a more of an expectancy bias when you come into a study and you get to go to a cool meditation arm? There's those sort of issues, but then there's also sort of how physiologically. If indeed compassion training does things to the brain and body that reduce inflammatory responses to psychosocial stressors, what are the physiologic pathways that mediate that? And I, I just 
want to give you little tidbits of data that I find intriguing. And again, this is very resonant with what uh, Dr. Porges was saying this morning. You put people at TSST, and they're, they're, they have a very powerful autonomic response. And their autonomic response is that their parasympathetic nervous system uh, uh, basically withdraws, and if it's really bad, they get an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, what we found in everybody is that the more that parasympathetic nervous system withdraws, the more interleukin-6 goes up. People walk into that stressor, they get a very rapid sort of stress-induced crash in their parasympathetic tone, and that's pretty highly correlated with their inflammatory measures an hour or two later. We never published this because it didn't quite make significance, but, but it, there's a pretty interesting pattern. The kids that were in the high practice group didn't have that loss of parasympathetic tone in response to the stressor. So one possibility is just that they came into the stressor and their brain-body complexes didn't activate autonomic pathways in ways that are known to induce inflammation. Another possibility is that they just were more subtle in how they thought about the TSST. Subsequently, in adults, as part of the CALM study, we, it's a small cohort, but we did a neuroimaging study uh, at Emory where we did this reading the mind and the eyes task where you're very briefly shown this face and you either pick whether it's male or female and then you have to say what the emotion is. This task has been associated with all sorts of uh, people with autism don't do well with this. People with depression don't do well with this. Uh, well, it turned out that the compassion training actually enhanced this ability uh, pretty strikingly compared to the health discussion control group. These slides are a little busy, but the green, you can see the green people have better uh, accuracy. The accuracy was largely accounted for. Much of the variance came from the fact that accuracy was also associated with increases in several brain areas that are parts of, of, of theory of mind areas. This is a kind of a classic mirror neuron area. So, you know, it may be that the training actually made people more able to look at the, the panel. There's evidence now that the panel and the participants, that their cortisol levels rise and fall with each other, that although we think we're testing the subject, it's actually a, a sort of a, a dyadic dance of sorts. So it may just be uh, that they didn't activate their autonomics because they looked at the panel, and it's hard to frown at people and be nasty, and saw just subtle little things that suggested ambivalence. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to test that. It's just really interesting. Finally, uh, one thing we noticed also was that only in the kids who had, now we're back to the kids, only in the kids who had uh, the higher amount of practice, they were the only group that brought their inflammatory responses in line with their stated emotions. So with everybody else, if you said you felt terrible, it didn't correlate with your physiologic state at all. But if you practice compassion meditation, if you said you, to the degree you said you felt upset, your IL-6 went up to that same degree and it was a very striking correlation. So maybe this enhanced interoceptive awareness also had something to do with the ability to modulate inflammation. And then finally, uh, one of the ways that we've extended these data, uh, giving a talk like this, the then Commissioner of Human Resources for the state of Georgia, really decided that CBCT was something she wanted to see in the very, very troubled teens in foster care. So we did, a, we did a, a randomized trial of 71 of these kids, randomized to either six weeks of CBCT or uh, a wait list in this case. The control group wasn't as good. We found exactly the same thing. It's interesting. No effective group assignment, but within the kids who uh, did the CBCT, now we're not looking at TSSTs, and we couldn't justify doing that. We just took saliva and measured this very sort of classic inflammatory biomarker called C-reactive protein. And what you can see is that the more the kids practiced, uh, and they, they, some of them practiced a lot, but a lot of them didn't practice that much. But even with that, in, that there was this, the more they practiced, the lower their inflammation. And so this was a fascinating study because this was a rough group of kids. They, were, they brought knives to class. They brought guns to class. It was a very serious situation. And even there, we see this repeated signal that there may be something in this technique that shows promise for what Richie was talking about last night, about the embodied nature of compassion. And so that's it. You know, this is only a partial list. There have literally been hundreds of people that have been involved with this work. I introduced collaborators to each other here. They didn't even know they existed. It's a wild network of fun. So anyway, thank you very much for your time, uh, and thanks for having me.